Hey everyone, Viv here. In case you missed it, I wanted to let you know that we have a fortnightly email newsletter. We give you the latest recap on all things happening in our community. In there, you'll also be the first to know about our next events, merch drops, and exciting announcements. Head on over to levelasianpodcast.com forward slash newsletter to sign up for the latest. Now, on to the episode. One guy came up to me last night and he said, you know, thank you for sharing that, Vin, because my son also has autism. I think one of the things in, in our community, especially in the Asian community, is whether it's disability, whether it's mental illness, whatever it is, people don't talk about it. We want to hide that. And even I did. Initially, when my son had this, I didn't tell anyone. I was scared, man. I mean, I didn't I didn't know what Xander's future was going to be like. I was in so much fear. I've had to learn that if I treat it like it's something that I have to hide, what impact is that going to have on my son? Mm. I need to, be able to speak about these things openly. It's I don't think it's a negative thing. Mm. Whereas hiding it, it's as if you're ashamed of it. And I've only developed the courage, I think, in the last couple of years to talk about it more. Before we get started on today's episode, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the land of the Darug people. We would like to acknowledge and pay respects to our elders past and present and the next generation coming through. Now, on to today's episode. In this episode of the Level Asian Podcast, we're joined by our amazing guest, Vin Jang. If you're not familiar with Vin yet, he's an international speaker, a communications coach, an entrepreneur, and a magician. Vin opens up to us about his experience of moving schools five times due to severe bullying, failing year 12, navigating his son's autism, unlearning bad work habits, and prioritizing a better work-life balance. He also talks to us about the importance of sharing our parents' stories, why he chooses to do life auditing, and discusses the beauty of doing things you love with the people you love. Enjoy the episode. Your overall evaluation of how last night went, I'm actually really curious. What, what I said to Dave and I said to you already as well is that I was so worried when we started. Mm. I was so concerned that they weren't, people weren't gonna listen. Cause you're in a nightclub, you're standing. And when you're standing, you're fidgeting and you're not focused. Mm. So I just did not think people would listen. So first of all, I was super concerned. And then after it all played out, I think it went really amazing. Yeah. I really think it did. And I just felt like there was just one moment I was gloating to you guys before I have to say it again. It's just, I thought when, when I, there was a, there was a multiple, there, was, there were multiple moments where I paused and the room was dead silent. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's how I judge if it's a good event or not, right? Because people want to talk. It's 7 p.m. at night mm. and they're in a nightclub. And they're filled with alcohol. <laughs> they're filled with alcohol. And if they are silent, it means they're locked in. Yeah. You know, so I think regardless of the, the, the problems we thought were going to happen in terms of being too, nah, no, that doesn't matter. I think people loved it. But credit to you because we came, well, that's what we just said. Literally, it was like the VIN experience, which was we, we went to your workshop and I remember coming out of it and we were sitting on the flight. It was like a 10 p.m. flight back to Sydney. And all we did was we, we had like a, you know, it was an empty seat between us and we we're sitting um, in we're holding hands. We, we locked eyes. As you should be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mask on because it's still COVID. And we were like, that was the best two days of wow. personal development, like in our lives. Mm. Oh, wow. And it's crazy to think this was August last year, was it? Mm. When you had your workshop mm. um, that now we're sitting here having this conversation with you. Mm. Um, so firstly, I want to put it out there and I know I said it on stage, but really appreciate you taking the time out because I know hey. how busy you are as well. Pleasure. But dude, that was an incredible event last night. Mm. Cause that like, I, I noticed it as well. I was at the front of the room near the steps and it took you a while to, well, not it didn't take you that long, but you had to work it and get everyone yeah, you had to, to work the crowd. Yeah. And it was a tough crowd. I you felt know? like it was a tough crowd at the start. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah, was yeah. hard. Yeah. yeah. I looked you in the eyes a couple of times. I was like, I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> I, remember, I remember this eye contour. He was like, I'm sorry, Ken. I can't control the beast. And then what did I say back? I was like, you got this bit. <laughs> no, like, no, you gave me a look and you were like, you're fucked. <laughs> Am I Ken? Am I? Where's Davey? I need positivity. I'm hiding. Yeah, no, Davey was gone. And I was like, oh no, I it's couldn't like see anyone. Because you look concerned and it made me more concerned. <laughs> yeah, maybe you were just stressed. But no, no, but the room was like, it was silent. Yeah. It was silent. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'll tell you what it was. The turning point in that, um, in the, the, the show was the, you started talking about your personal life. Yeah, and yeah, I think yeah. that's where it resonated with people, resonated with me. And I've heard that story so many times mm. and it still resonates with me and gave me goosebumps every time I hear it. So yeah, I think that's when people started going, oh wow, this is this is something new. Mm. This is something that like this, this speaker actually is 
uh, uh, telling a story like our story. It was so, relatable. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think for me, maybe because I was up on stage was um, one of the questions about why you do communications and your response about um, doing it for Xander, your son. I think I lost count how many times people alluded to that particular story. Really? People were like goosebumps, like, you know? Yeah. Because it touched people. Yeah. You know, whether they have kids or not, they all have, you know, maybe family and loved ones. And um, that was something that was quite, it stood out for me throughout the night when people were talking about it, giving feedback. Mm. It's beautiful. One, one guy came up to me last night and he said, you know, thank you for sharing that, Vin, because my son also has autism. Oh. And I think, I think one of the things in, in our community, especially in the Asian community, is whether it's, you know, if, whether it's a disability, whether it's mental illness, whatever it is, people don't talk about it. Mm. We want to hide that. Mm. And even I did. You know, initially when my son had this, I didn't tell anyone. You know, I, I, I was scared, man. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know what Xander's future was going to be like. I didn't know. I was in so much fear. But I, you know, I, I've, I've had to learn that if I treat it like it's something that I have to hide, what impact is that going to have on my son? Mm. Mm. You know, I, I need to, be able to speak about these things openly. It's, I don't think it's a negative thing. Mm. Whereas hiding it, it's as if you're ashamed of it. You know, so I, I've only, and I've only developed the courage, I think in the last couple of years to talk about it more. Yeah, because it wasn't something that um, I think I knew about. I mean, yeah. consuming your content for a really long time. And I yeah. think it was, yeah, definitely a recent thing that you sort of opened up about. Mm. Well, I, I fear judgment still, right? Mm. Because I remember the first time I shared this, I immediately had a comment and I still remember it. It was like, well done for using your son's situation for great oh, marketing wow. purposes you know, you're a sellout. And I was like, oh, but that, I, like I, I knew that that person didn't have context. Uh, you know, I have the operating system to be able to process that and go, okay, well that person doesn't really know me. That's okay, but still it hurt. Mm. I was like, wow, how many people think this? How many think that, how many people think I'm using my son's autism as a marketing strategy? And then it stopped me. And then I, I stopped sharing it again. I was just like, you know what? Yeah, maybe. so it's just, it just goes to show that far out, you know, online, you leave a comment. Mm. It's it's a person on the other end receiving that. But I think people just dehumanize it. Yes. You know, yeah. Yeah. And if, Ovin's never going to see this. Yeah. I did. Yeah, I did, yeah. and it impacted me a yeah. lot. And I didn't share Xander thing again for another couple of years. Oh, a couple of years. A couple of years, long? man. Yeah. Because mm. I was like the first time I was being vulnerable, and I thought, oh, you know what? I'll, I'll share it because before this, Ken, you know, this just used to be a job for me but now it's a calling, right? So, so I started experiencing that in 2019. Mm. Shared it, got that comment, stopped. Got scared, yeah. Incredible. Well, I mean, speaking of kids, um, you know, we always like to start from the beginning, which is origin stories. And you, mm. you've told many origin stories about mm. yourself growing up. Would love to sort of hear it from you um, about you yourself growing up yeah. and what that was like, I guess, overall um, in Adelaide. <laughs> and then I'd love to sort of keep going through, say, you know, high school and then, you know, university career and all that sort of stuff as well. Yeah, in, in, in primary school, I, I couldn't speak English up until I was about seven or eight. So I first learned did you? And then I learned Vietnamese, then I learned English. So when I went to school, I was one of the few kids that couldn't speak English. So I was bullied for that main reason because I couldn't speak English. And when I did, I sound really funny. So then I got teased a lot. I was always on my own. I didn't have many friends. And, you know, I, I, I share this before. You've, you've heard me say this. I used to sit in the toilet because I didn't want to look like a loser standing by myself. So I would spend so much time in the toilet just, just waiting it out just waiting out lunch and waiting out recess because I couldn't talk to anyone. And, and when I reflect on that, you know, I, I have so much empathy for like my son because my son Xander doesn't have language yet. Mm. He, he has it, but at a very simple way. And it's like, wow, I, I kind of went through, I don't have autism, but I went through that as well in my own way. So, so growing up far out, it was, it was lonely. Uh, it was, it was really sad, <laughs> it was frustrating, I was really angry. So you cue violin music for all of my primary school years and then I get to high school and then we'll, we'll change the music and we'll go to Lincoln Park now because that's when I'm, I'm, I'm angry and I'm pissed <laughs> mm. because of all that sadness and all the anger kept up inside, I got really angry. And then all of high school, I got bullied so much and, and it would it would always be because of this. 
it would be, I still remember these, these two incidences. I would be walking in the city in Adelaide in Rundle Mall and these gangsters would see me and they would, they would say, uh, hey, dickhead. And I'd, I'd, I'd be like, why am, I, why am I a dickhead? You're a dickhead for calling me a dickhead. You don't even know me. So, so you're a dickhead. Beat me up. Because of that. Because of that, right. And another situation, another gaming place in Adelaide called Tilt. It was a cool game place. Tried to go there, try to play games and stuff on like DDR and stuff like that. And then another like bully would say, what are you looking at? I'm like, how would you know I was looking at if you, if, if you weren't looking at me? So you were looking at me. So what are you looking at? Beat up. <laughs> right. And I was just like, man, what the hell? This sucks. I always get, I'm just, I'm just asking you genuinely, what, what are you talking about? And I would just get beat up time and time again. I moved high schools five times. Uh, but that, that, as you guys know, moving high school so many times allowed me to reinvent myself. Mm-hmm. So I reinvented myself five times over. For those who are listening from Adelaide, I went to Parafield Gardens. Then I went to Thomas More College. Then I went to Blackfriars. Then I went to St. Ignatius. Then I went to Theberton Senior College. I went to five different schools, five different versions of Vin at every school. And I think that's something I was able to do that I think a lot of people don't give themselves permission to do. You can reinvent yourself, you know, and, and, and I've only recently shared publicly that like I, I changed my name when I was 15 years old. Mm. My name was Kwang when I was born, but then I changed it to Vin. It was a part of my reinvention. Mm-hmm. I just wanted, I didn't want to be that version of me anymore that was angry, hated the world, felt sad, blamed everybody else. Vin was someone who took responsibility and crafted the future that he wanted and took ownership, right? So it was this, it was this crazy journey of sadness to anger, to frustration, to transformation. So it was just- And like during high school, you, I mean, the reinventions, what, what were they? Cause I'm actually curious, you know? And also how did you reinvent yourself? Well, because when I go to a new school, no one knows who I am. It was a hard reset. It's a hard reset. So yeah. no one knew who I was. So I remember that. So when I left, <laughs> when I left, uh, when I left the powerful guard, Thomas More College, and I went to Black Fries, I thought, okay, I'm going to try to be a bully now. Mm. I've been bullied my whole life. I'm going to be hard on the first day. I'm going to be really hard. I remember I had a hot dog. <clears throat> uh, I was standing in line, I had a hot dog and these, these guys were teasing me. So I threw the hot dog in this guy's face. And then all the Italians were like, oh man, this guy skits, bro, he skits. <laughs> I was like, hell yeah, I'm skits, don't mess with me. Right? And then a real bully came along, punched me in the face and that was the end of that. I left that school within four weeks. Like wow. immediately. That quick? That quick, because the bullying was so, in all boys school, bullying was so intense, so fast, wow. so crazy, right? that one of the fathers there felt so sorry for me because he knew, I think he knew I wasn't a bully. I was just pretending to be, to protect myself. And then he pleaded St. Ignatius, which is even a higher up school to take me in. Mm. What? This was a, one of the other kids' one of the parents. Other, yeah. No, 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 sorry. A father is in like a priest. Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry. So, so he felt, cause it was mm, a Catholic mm. school. So he felt so bad for me because look, and he was Vietnamese too. Mm. And he said, look, let me, I'm gonna do everything I can to get you into a school just to get you out of this environment. Wow. You know, and don't be a bully. That's not who you are. And then he got me into it, like an even better school, right? And then I went to this next school. So again, transformation was sad, angry, to bully, mm-hmm. to go to St. Ignatius. And then and when I went to St. Ignatius, I was like, these kids in this, these schools, they get 50 bucks a week for lunch. Mm. I got 10 or five, a dollar a day, maybe $2 a day if I'm lucky, right? <clears throat> so I realized, wow, I could sell these kids stuff these kids were rich. So that's when the entrepreneurial version of me started. That's when I, at the time was an MD player. Do you remember MD, MD players? Yeah. Dude, I used to, I was the one and very few people who knew how to put music on the mini discs. Mm. So I'd put music on the mini discs for all these rich kids. And then I'd, you know, I'd charge them every time they want new songs on it, you know, new Backstreet Boys, 98 Degrees, <laughs> new flavor, mm. you know. And then I would do that all for them. I'd charge them money. And I made so much money there that in the end, the, the principal found out and he came and he said, look, I'm gonna to have to stop what you're doing. You're not gonna get in trouble, but I'd like you also to donate a part of the money that you've made to buying some sporting equipment. <laughs> oh, wow. So super cool, Didn't not, nothing happened. No, no, I thought you were literally gonna say, but I also want you to get me another version. Yeah. That's your lesson, <laughs> yeah. get me MD. Yeah, 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 give me the millennium <laughs> album. That guy's a politician, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and then he became our prime minister. <laughs> no, but then it was, it was crazy, but then, 
But then, man, the sad part of that, that story is that I flourished there. Uh, and then my parents couldn't afford anymore that school. Oh. It, it was seven grand a year, yeah. right? So my mom had to borrow money from people to put me into that school. And I saw the financial strain it caused my parents. And I was like, you know what? I'm, 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 not, I'm not an academic anyway, but I was thriving there. Made great friends, wasn't bullied anymore. Mm. None of that. And then, so I said, mom, dad, look, I, I don't want to go there anymore. Mm. You know, I don't want to go there anymore. So I made up stories about why do you want to go there? And how old were you at that time? 15, 16. Wow. But I saw mom and dad struggle. I saw them struggle. You know, my dad, fell off a ladder, had chronic back pain, couldn't lift five kilos at the time and you know, suffering in his own way. we well, barely making ends meet. And my mom was borrowing money, people looking down on my mom, mom was crying on the phone, heard these phone calls. I, I, I saw it, man. I think parents sometimes don't realize how smart kids are. And then I just went, all right, mom, I, I don't want to go there anymore. I just don't, just, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to go there anymore. So then I actually went back to Thomas More College. Oh, you went back? Because it's cheaper. And it was near my house. My mom and dad used to drive an hour plus to get me to school. Oh, and then wow. an hour plus to drive me home every day and loan a bunch of money, right? Mm. So I kind of thought, I don't want to do that anymore, Tom. Like, I don't want to do it. So then cheaper school, closer to home, yep. back to the bad environment. Why would you go Why would you go back and why wouldn't you try a different school? Like, was it purely because of the locality? Yeah. yeah okay. it, was, it was five minutes from my house. Wow. It was five minutes from my house. And I just felt at that point, I felt so, in, I just felt so terrible that I felt like a shit kid. B, I was doing terrible academically, even though I felt safe at that school. I felt like I was flourishing in different ways. But I just, I, I felt like it, through the academic system, I felt like a failure. And I was like, well, why would I be wasting mum and dad's money they don't even have mm. to be a failure? I might as well just, just who cares? Yeah. Who cares? And I genuinely felt like a deadbeat. I genuinely felt like a deadbeat. So I was like, oh, you know what? I'm not gonna waste their money. I'll, I'll just go back to this school. And then I, I, I went back to that school, got caught up with the wrong group of people again, failed year 12. Uh, so I failed year 12. And then, you know, I don't, I don't really share this often, right? But then, but then I had a girlfriend at the time she so year 12, I failed. Mm. She got into aerospace engineering and I failed year 12. And then she was such a, she, she, I'm sure she still is and such a beautiful person in that she goes, you know what? I'm gonna tell my parents that I'm gonna do year 13 with you and get you through this. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then here's the, the sh most shameful part about this whole this situation. I'd already fallen out of love with her, mm. but I didn't know how to tell her. I didn't have the courage as a man to tell her. So I, and this is one of the biggest regrets of my life. So I dragged her along this journey where she benefited me. And she, I got in the end, I got like 87, 88 TER, which is the score. Went th all through year 13. I, I look back on this and one of the deepest things I regret because I shouldn't have done that. Mm. That is one of the most terrible things I feel I've done as a human being is I knew I'd, I, I, I'd fallen out of love with her already. And I just didn't, I didn't have the communication ability. I didn't have, I didn't want to have tough conversations, rather just avoid it. And I dragged this poor girl along who put her life on pause and helped me in so many ways. And, and oh man, and so, so she, she went to Theberton Senior College, which is an adult school. Mm -hmm. uh, sat with me through the full year, tutored me through every Sam damn class. Yeah. She didn't need to do it. Wow. If you had it again, what would you do? I would, I would have the courage to tell her the yeah. truth. I wouldn't have wasted a year of her life. Mm. Yeah. Have you spoken to her since? No, no, I haven't. And I, I think I, it's weird because it's like, this is my, it's almost like an apology that I've never had the courage to say to her myself. I, you know, I, I feel so bad about it, you know? But I mean, like, I think it's, um, yeah. I think we all have re regrets yeah. in our life. I was gonna say, like, yeah. I don't yeah. think it's- um, Especially when it comes to like, you know, romance and stuff, right? You know, definitely. We're, we're, we don't know what we're doing and we yeah. don't ask people for advice sometimes. And usually when we ask people for advice, it's our peers and, mm. It's kids. We don't even know what those guys are doing and yeah. what they're doing with white. <clears throat> and trust me, that's not that bad. Like I've, I'm sure there's worse stories out there when it comes to you know relationships. Yeah, it's just it's interesting because when people ask me, inevitably people always ask me. They go, "Hey, what's what's one of your regrets?" Hmm. It's funny. It's nothing to do with business. 
it's nothing to do with any of that. It, it's to do with, yeah, it's just like just someone who's who was such a beautiful soul, and yeah, I, I just wasn't, you know, and and like whether it's like greed or selfish or I think it was that you oh, dude, I'm selfish along. for sure, I, I, yeah. for sure, because I knew in my heart that if she stayed back with me, I'd get through this. Mm-hmm. And it's like one of the, like when I th- talk about this, when I think back, it's, I feel so dirty, man. I feel so bad, mm. you know? And I think, yeah, if anything, I just, I just, yeah, I, I yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing that as well. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> well, I mean, to change gears a little bit, I mean, you talk about your parents a lot mm. and um, I, I can feel the, out of all of our interactions, you know, going to your workshop and even last night, Mm. Uh, the the love you have for your parents, you know, and I I I I thought back as you were telling me about you um, changing schools and sort of realizing how much your parents struggled. I was a brat as a kid, like I was fifteen, sixteen. I was yeah, me too. I was just worried about myself, yeah, right? Those my yeah. parents like slave away, yeah. running their own business or trying to make money, make ends meet, and I like it wasn't even in my area of orbit to even think about what I could do for them. But certainly, I felt like whether it was during at that time or even subsequently later, you know, mm. cause I feel like, you know, as you get older, you grow closer with your parents as well. In a lot of ways you appreciate um, the things they've done. Mm. Um, how do you, how do you sort of describe your parents? Cause I've, I've seen you describe in many ways and maybe if you can yeah. do your mom and then your dad and then go from there. Well, mom, uh, mom, mom controls all the money. <laughs> mom controls uh, everything in the household. I, so my mom's an incredible leader. My dad, has an incredibly big heart. And even since when I was young, my dad would give away more than we have because that's how big his heart was. Mm. And sometimes it would affect our family negatively because when they first came to Australia, we still have family members in Vietnam. Mm. So then the responsibility of those who come over here is to then help look after those back in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So then my dad would often always send more money than we actually even have back to Vietnam because he felt guilt. We got away, they didn't. And then as a result of that, sometimes our family wouldn't have money and my mom would always you know, get upset at him and go, hey, how come you gave more away than we have? What about your own children? You're, you know. and, and when I was young, I got angry at my dad too, but I just didn't realize, wow, my dad's got such a big heart. Mm. He's got such a big heart. And then just he, his love for his family and for everyone is just, it's, he's just got such a big heart. You know, whereas, whereas I felt like mom, really mom focused on the family. Mum always looked after me, but dad always wanted to look after me, mum and everybody else. So that's the kind of two characters that were really conflicting. So a lot of the arguments when we were young was dad wanting to help more people and, and mum going, hey, impact starts at home. So and you I, gotta look after yourself yeah. first, look after others. Mm-hmm. I, I wanna have impact, but that's what I've learned from my parents. I learned, I've learned that I, before I wanna go save the world, <laughs> I've got to make sure I, I, I put my family first. If I can't have impact at home, I, there's, there's no point in me trying to have impact in the world. So I, I learned that from them because I, I saw the conflicting nature of that. Mm. Yeah, so. It was very vivid. I mean, I, I think probably this is a good time to also say, you know, like reflecting back on even last night and the months leading up to the event, um, this stuff is not possible without wives, partners, yeah. friends. Well, Right, like Davey's very, he raises this all the time. I probably don't do it enough. But like, for example, with Iris allowing me to do mm. what I did last night, like mm. she would have been at home yeah. looking after Hudson. Yeah. You know, it would have been an 18, 22 hour day for her. And same with Shirley. She it was a birthday. Her birthday. <laughs> it was a birthday last night. <laughs> yeah. The poor thing was wearing a little crown across her head saying it's my birthday. I was like, you didn't even tell me. I should have brought her on stage. <laughs> we uh, thought about it actually. I, I, I should have brought her on stage. I, I asked her about it and she was wow. like, no. I do not want to be on stage. Oh. Do not make me on stage. And I was oh. like, I'll, I'll divorce you. <laughs> so I was like, All right, bye, but bye. also pay when yeah, and Xander yeah, yeah, as yeah. well, right? Yes. Like yeah. I think um, to allow us, because we're quite ambitious people, we do a lot of things and even Jake, <laughs> would you say? Oh, <laughs> but look like partners and um, wives, husbands, whatever it is, you know, you're supporting loved ones. It's, yeah. um, it's it's the it's the people also behind the scenes yeah. you know that that make this stuff happen i tell you what there there's they sacrifice for us to do what mm-hmm. we love there's a price that is paid and whether they tell you at times or not there's a price that they're paying i'm very aware of it 
as much as Paywen supports me and, and, and is so encouraging of what I do, I know there's a price that she pays. I know, I know. Because there's nights where I'm away. I was gone for a five week tour in the US. There's a price your partner pays for that. So it, it's, it's not easy and it's not free and it's not, so, so it, it's, uh, I always ask, I always say to Paywen, I always say, like, why do you love me? Because on the book sometimes, man, it looks bad. <laughs> It does. It just, it just looks bad. I'm just like, I'm always working. I'm always working. I'm always, because that's a trap of doing what you love. Yeah. I think the trap of doing what you love, it, it, like it, it sounds great on a social media post, do what you love, but there's a dark side to it. There's a hundred percent of dark side. There's man. such a dark side to it. Yeah. I, I loved what I did last night so much that to the point where you guys know this, yeah. at one point in my career, I was away 200 plus days a year on 180 flights mm. in a year. People don't do that sometimes in a lifetime. I did that in, 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 in 365 days, right? And there's a dark side to it. And I don't really think people explore that much because- I, Yeah, I, I, I want to stop you here because I, I really want to get this out. Um, like a couple of weeks ago, Shirley called me up at 11 p.m. And she she was like, why aren't you here? And she was going through something with her family and she came home late at night and she was freaking out and she was scared and I was still at work and I didn't pick up the phone call because I just didn't see it. And she's like, "You, it's 11 p.m. Why aren't you here? Like, I'm scared. You know, things are going on with family and you're not here. And this is a weeknight and I just, that's the dark side of it. Like you're so consumed in- Yeah, you're absorbed in it. Following your dreams mm. and you have this support, but you're not there for your loved ones when they, when you want to be. And that, you know, and I, I shared this when I drive here, that concerned me so much the last couple of weeks because I just felt like I was never there for family. Yeah. And never, and then I was like working so hard because I wanted to achieve these dreams. It makes our family happy. It makes everyone happy. It makes everyone feel proud. But the fact that you're not there for your family when they need you, that's the dark side. It's so- yeah. Like what's it all for, I suppose, isn't yeah. it? You know? It is the most difficult thing to balance that I've ever experienced in my life. It's how hard is that to balance, right? Because, because too much of it is bad, too little of it is bad. I struggle with it. I, I had a conversation with Pei Wen as well, Davey, the other, just a couple of weeks ago where she goes, sometimes when you're, you're here, I feel like you're not here. Mm. And I'm like, that's a good call out. You called me out. It's true. I, my head is in a different place, you know, and I struggle with it too, Davey. I struggle with it still. And I think it's so easy to paint a picture that I've just got my stuff all worked out. I don't, man, I'm still struggling with it. We're all struggling with mm. I've had those phone calls, brother. I've had those phone calls and, uh, and I'm halfway across the world. I'm half crashed across the world. And that's even tougher, isn't it? Like, you know, yeah. a lot of ways, because I guess not to discount what happened, but, yeah. you know, you did pick up the phone and, you know, 15 minute drive away, you on the other side of the planet. Yeah. You I, know? Man, when I was in the US, this was in 2019. Uh, I, was, uh, I was in my place in Southern California. Paywin was in Malaysia and I got a similar phone call to you. And Paywin called me and, you know, she, she called me and she goes, um, hey, it's a miscarriage and you know i was i was half a world away you know and i was i was like i was like fuck i'm not there and i can't get to you yeah you know and like i felt so bad man and i remember just i i, I so vividly remember this i was sitting in my closet just crying and going that like hey you know the moment my wife needs me the most i'm not there yeah you know and you know, I just went, wow, what am I doing? And, and, and it just made me think that I, I realized that what, what has happened in my DNA is that I've watched my mom and dad work their entire lives. Mm -hmm. I've watched them work their entire lives. My parents, I love them, but they didn't teach me how to live. They taught me how to work. They taught me how to sacrifice. They taught me how to work, but they didn't teach me how to live. They didn't teach me how to be present. They didn't, and it's okay, I don't blame them. I love my mom and I love my dad. They gave me more than I could ever ask for. But I've realized that I, I don't know how to live. 
And, and I recognized that. I remember that call I got, Davey, and, and I went, something needs to change. I, I have to learn the other dimensions of who I am. I, I'm not just a communication teacher. I'm not just a, a keynote speaker. You know, like I'm, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm, I'm Vin. You know, and I still struggle with that balance yeah. because it's programmed into me. I've seen my mum and my dad work their entire, dad used to work two jobs, right? I, my mum used to turn our backyard garden to grow chives and to sell them at the local grocery store for, for 20 cents. So we make 10 cents. Yeah. yeah everything, was about, everything was about money when I was growing up. You know, I was, appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. I mean, Dude, that is like, yeah. yeah, yeah it's, it's tough, man. That's why we, we gotta be present sometimes and we just gotta make some time for ourselves. Yeah, so what has changed since then? Like, have you tried to, like, you know, give some more time to the family? And, uh, and that probably makes sense that you've moved back. That's why I came back. Yeah. The, the, the US was, like, you guys got to know, you know I'm from Adelaide, right? And I, I come from the northern suburbs, you know, it's it's the hood. And I never had any opportunities growing up. So I, I did, I was a I was hands down loser when growing up. Uh, textbook loser. I've never experienced opportunity like America. I all of a sudden who went from no university degree, my community looked down on me, broken up with ex-partners because their parents, like their parents thought I was a loser and drop out, all of that. And then going to the US and now I'm working with Microsoft, now I'm working with Zoom, now I'm working with Google, now I'm working with Facebook, like what the frick? And and so so not having no opportunity to that, I was drunk on it. So I, I knew the only way for me to be a better husband, a better better father, better son, better friend, better contributor to the world, is if I unplug from that system. I had to leave it because I had no self-control while I was there. In the US, it was more, more is better. More is more, more is always more. Mm. And then the more I got, the more I wanted. And then I still remember my, my dad telling me, my old man, he said this line to me that changed it all for me. And, he, and I actually came home because of this one sentence, he says, a king that knows the limits to his desires will rule a lifetime. I'd lost track mm. completely. So I, 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 I left, you know, and, and everyone said to me, it's career suicide, Vin. Mm. You, you how sunk cost fallacy. Do you know how many years you put into this, Vin? Mm. You moved from Australia to do this. Mm. Vin, you've, you've worked your ass off for the last four years. Do you know where you would be if you, you stayed? You know, and, and I, I just said to them, yeah, maybe it's, yeah, but I'm also destroying my happiness. I'm also destroying my family. Mm. And I'm also destroying myself. Yeah, so I came home. So I've had to learn how to say no. But, but again, I'm human, right? Mm. I'm human, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wow, Vin, that's amazing. I just went back to the US for five weeks. Yeah. Right? Again, it's a, it's a constant, mm. it's that, man, that desire for more. I'm still navigating it right now. It's mm. like, how, how do you manage that? Mm. Because it just, oh man, our human beings, we, we want more and. I, I have a struggle and I can relate mm. to, I guess all of us here of like, we're playing essentially an infinite game mm. because there's no finish line to this. Yeah. So the game of more is literally like, all right, I've hit this. What's the next big thing? What's yeah. the next big thing, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I was telling you literally off camera just before this, I really struggle to say no to things. Yeah. And not knowing where my boundaries are. And that's landed me in trouble before, you know, you guys um, sharing your stories. And I think even, you know, Iris and, you know, even recently, I think like last month, she said all I, she's like, I don't, I, I know how hard it is for you. Um, but the big thing for me is um, I just want you home earlier. Yeah. You know, and not just that, like home earlier and present. Yeah. Right. Because otherwise it's the scrolling of the phone. Everything's yeah. infinite, right? Social media is infinite. Yeah. And it's really like, it's really tough. Like, I don't think I've done a, a good job at all about it. You know, like mm. I'm much like you guys, I'm um, working out and, you know, I, I don't think I've quite cracked it. And I think there's a lot of guilt, even, you know, every day in the office, there's all these amazing opportunities of having all these doors that are opening and, um, you know, the clock comes around to five thirty, six o'clock and I'm like, why, like I shouldn't be here. Mm. Like I, I, that comes across my mind a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's tough. Yeah. 
I think it's important to like set the boundaries with the relationships or like, you know, the people that you're working with, mm. have, like with the business and yeah. with your, the peop- the workmates and, you know, you're with your family and all that stuff like that. So the answer is boundaries. Yeah. Mm. I remember Brene Brown says it, mm. the kindest, most generous, most loving people who remain kind, loving and generous their entire lives, they have the clearest boundaries. Whereas I can tell you now what happens if you don't have boundaries. Gradually, all of that love, kindness, and generosity becomes bitterness. Because when you keep saying yes to everyone, what happens gradually? You become bitter. Mm. Even I started feeling it. That's why now I have really clear boundaries. I still struggle, but I have really clear boundaries. I say no to so much now, Ken. David, me too. I say no to so much now, so much. Because again, uh, you, you were saying you struggle to say no. When I say no now to anyone, even that I love and care about, I say, hey, when I, if I say yes to this, Ken, I am actually saying no to Pei Wen and Xander right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and people understand. People understand. People get it. It's just we have to learn how to communicate that. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, and, and yeah. There was, there was one thing I heard as well was um, – uh, like from some podcast, I can't remember where it was. And they said that if you're ever trying to accept something right now, like fast forward five years, mm. would you be happy then? Mm. And that's something that I've been trying to ask myself all the mm. time now. So if I want to go and start this business venture, fast forward five years, would I be happy that I'm on this business venture, spending less time with family and spending less time with this other business, uh, with the current business I have, yeah. would I be happy? Mm-hmm. And yes, I'll be making a lot more money or, um, you know, it could be a complete flop, whatever it is, but I don't think I would still be happy because I just would be spending less time with mm. my, my partner, which I just got married to with, and I'm probably going to have kids. Like it's just, yeah. So I've said, no, I'm start, I'm starting to say no a bit more. Well, Davey's definitely been much better at it recently. And he's been <laughs> the guy telling me, Hey, be careful. Like, and I literally said yes to something for next month down in Melbourne that, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, like not that I should have said no, but I think I, I think I catch myself sometimes I'm too quick to commit to things and yeah. saying yes to things. And I'm yeah. saying like give me a moment to pause and well, actually that, think about it. That's one of the dangers of doing something you love. Mm. Right? It's so easy to say yes because everything's it's fine. hell yeah, right? Yeah, everything's a hell yeah. Yeah. It's true, man. It's the struggles of life, <laughs> brother. But, but I mean it's just, just this is just the truth. Mm. I don't, I don't really, I don't know anyone who has it all together mm. because once I get to know anyone and I really, we really get to know each other and we see behind the scenes. It's why one of the quotes I never really understood in Buddhism was everyone is suffering. I remember the first time I heard that, I was like, that is the most negative <laughs> thing I've ever heard ever. No, not everyone's suffering. But now I truly understand. I'm like, wow, it's true. We're all suffering in our own way. Yeah. Everyone is suffering. Yeah, Everyone has their own form of suffering. I've heard, I think, I don't know if it's the same quote, but I have heard some permutation of that, which is um, to live is to struggle. Yeah. And that is that to say like human life is struggle yeah. and pain, right? Yeah. Um, and so there's, I mean, there's obviously um, beliefs around that, but you mentioned obviously like your, your career went off the charts, you know, when you were in the US, but you were miserable. Yeah, dude, it was awful. Yeah, I mean, tell us a bit about yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, y- you boys know this, but it's it was around 2019 as well. I was in New York in a hotel room and it was the first morning I've ever woken up and I didn't want to do what I loved. Hmm. And I remember waking up there in the hotel, I was alone. <clears throat> and I just went, wow, I don't want to do this keynote. I want to do it. And I just, I felt like, wow, I'm in trouble. And I remember that's when I picked up the phone and I called my best mate, Ali, uh, Ali Tarai. And I called him up and he was in Melbourne. And I said, ah, oh, man, something's wrong. I don't know what it is. Uh, and one of my best friends in my life, he just goes, hey, man, hang tight. It's Wednesday. I'll see you Friday. I'm flying over right now. Don't go home to your family. No. I got you. Don't go home to your family. Let's sort this out. I got you. We flew over to New York. We spent a whole week together. He was walking with me in Central Park. We went for like five hour walks every day talking. And he was basically my therapist. Wow. And he walked me through it. He walked me through the whole thing. And, and what he helped me realize again there was that I was one dimensional. And you know what? I found myself reading a book. And the book I was reading was a book about, <laughs> and this is when I knew I was in a really bad place. I was reading a book about why detectives kill themselves. 
Ooh. Yeah, right. And I was like, what the hell am I reading, even reading this? And I read it because I related so much to the fact that the detectives would often kill themselves at the end of their careers because they have such a powerful role in society. We catch the bad guys and it's honorable, right? What they do. And they attach themselves fully and they are obsessed about catching these criminals. It's their identity. It's their identity and the only part of their identity. So when they quit and they retire, they've completely lost their identity. Mm. And, and the lesson there is almost like I knew what the solution was for me. And the solution was to, you're a multi-dimensional human, yet you've only worked out this one dimension. And that's what Ali helped me discover too. He's like, hey man, you, you don't have any, you know, the saddest thing, right? It was, um, I had a day off and Pewen and Zan were like, oh, we're gonna go to the park. Um, you know, I want you to have your own day and just go relax and do whatever you want. And I remember sitting there for five minutes, made myself a coffee. I was like, yeah, finally a day off. You know, don't have to do anything with Pewen or Zan. I've got my day off. And you know, five minutes later, I walked straight back into the office. I worked. That's, that's us. Yeah, I was just about to say, I was like, that sounds like us. But, bro, that, but, but for, to, to me, that's, that's what led me to, I was in trouble. Yeah. Those were the early signs of trouble. I, I was like, oh yeah, but it's cool. I love what I do. I'm so lucky, right? But then the, what was waiting for me may never come for you guys, okay? But it came for me. The end of that route for me was I had no identity outside of this. Whereas you give me a day off now, man, I'm packing up the Jeep and the trailer. We're going camping. We're going to Marion Bay, right? You, you give me three nights, oh, we're going somewhere further, right? We're doing a road trip. And, and if you give me a day to myself, man, I'm going to go do archery. I'm going to go into the valley that is uh, Upper Hermitage in South Australia and I'll, I'll disappear for five hours and I'll just do archery. You know, I'll shoot arrows across a pond to hit things. You know, I'm, I'm gone, I'm out. So I, I now have things to do and, and, and that, I measure success by that now for me mm-hmm. is, is not just finance or whatever, it's that, but also I'm a more rounded person. There are things that I enjoy. I'm doing this. Mm-hmm. This isn't a business decision. <laughs> this is a happiness decision. This is a connection decision. This is a, I love you guys. I love what you're all doing. Mm. Yeah, whereas before, everything was ROI based. <laughs> whereas now I'm just trying to be a more wholesome person. So I encourage you to, you know, f- find something that you love so much as well outside of this that has nothing to do with money, nothing to do with business that you can just make time sink and disappear on because that's you teaching Hudson. That's you teaching your future kids and yours (laughs) as well. That's you teaching them not only how to work, but how to live and to be a multi-dimensional person because we are. And I think that's the curse of success where I find myself, even when I've got spare time, Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about, oh, I'll just get back on the computer and knock out a bit more work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or there's another opportunity and I'm seeing these signals as a red flag for myself as well, where, Mm. you know, before, I mean, think like even back to a simpler life, you know, before running a business that, you know, I'd be traveling or, you know, photographer, I haven't picked up a camera in, yeah, you know, know, and you were three, really, four, and I, yeah, you yeah, were really I had it. It was it was by my hip yeah. when I when I traveled for that one year. Mm. That camera was more important to me than anything else in in terms of personal belongings because wow. it was a way for me to, um, I guess, see it from a and like this is a terrible pun, but like how to frame life mm. up in a lot of ways because yeah. I had a different appreciation for everything. Mm. You know, I'd be in a new city. The camera would give me, you know, I'd appreciate the detail. Made you things. present. Yeah, it made me very present. Mm. And I feel like I lost a lot of that wow. um, setting up the business. And just hearing you say that as well is a, a reminder to, um, you know, find those things again. And yeah. as you said, multidimensional. Now here's where things get really complex, mm. right? Because yeah, that's nice. Sure, we should all find that. But then for you to achieve the success that you will have achieved required a period of sacrifice. Mm. I, I, I've never met anyone who is able to wake up and journal for an hour, meditate for an hour, sauna for 20 minutes, cold plunge <laughs> yeah. between sauna and that for another hour, and then be able to start their day and create something incredibly successful, right? Mm. I, I, I haven't met people who have a complete balanced life and have this exponential trajectory to success. I've never genuinely seen that, I haven't. Everyone I've met who has achieved something, there's a period of their life where it was completely unbalanced and they sacrificed a lot. Now, the problem with that period when you sacrifice a lot 
is you ingrain behaviors that are very hard to untrain now. It's so hard to untrain because for since my late teens, like last night we were joking, but I, it, to me it wasn't a joke. That's the third time I've ever been in a nightclub. Mm. I've never been because I never go with my friends. I'd be out working because I felt like a failure. I can't go to a nightclub. I can't party. I haven't earned that. I have to go work, right? So to me, since late teens, and maybe you both are the same, is that we've repeated a certain behavior that is high anxiety, that is high stress, that is high strung. Like we're, we're so attentive to the business. Oh, email, well, I'll reply to it now. Right. Have to, yes. yeah. survival, man, it's survival. Mm. But imagine, imagine training a, a, the same behavior for 15 years and then automatically thinking to yourself that, oh yeah, it's easy. Once I get there, I'll just untrain mm, it. Yeah. We, we were talking yesterday. I, I, I work for, for, for Microsoft and I was on stage and I said, hey guys, just Google it. Yeah. Uh, that is a simple language behavioral pattern that I, I said at the wrong place at the wrong time. Think about the behavioral things that exist in your life that have helped you build a successful business. Mm. You, you, I think you just have to recognize that it takes a lot of work to untrain that behavior. Yeah. So, so don't just hate on yourself and blame yourself. Is that you're undoing 15 years of habits. It takes time and it's hard. Hundred percent. I feel it's weird. I don't. I, I said it to my missus about this, and I said like I sometimes feel very comfortable going to work. Like as in this is my it's like natural habitat. Mm. Yeah. So when mm. things go bad, I kind of retreat back to work. Yeah, and that is bad. Like that's scary because then I get so consumed over work, uh, and I don't really face the challenges that I have, that I have to face. Yeah. You know, like we we're going through a lot of family emergencies and mm. sometimes like I just didn't, I didn't know how to, like I need to be strong for the family. So I retreat back to work sometimes to make my, me feel empowered. And then I can come back out and then, you know, solve the issues for family or be strong for the family which is weird. And I, I don't know if that's a good habit or a bad habit. It's like where you go to recalibrate. Yeah. Right. Cause I feel like I've got full control, but I also, and then I can go out there and then like, you know, but I don't know if that's a bad habit, but yeah, sometimes- mm, that, What do you think? Yeah. I think because you're good at this game. Yeah. Because you're effective here. Yeah. You make things happen here. Whereas when you, you feel more in control here, mm. that's why I do it. Mm. That's why I retreat to business. It's because I'm good at it. Whereas there was a situation that happened in the family and I can't solve it. I know I'm not effective there and I want progress and I, I'm addicted to progress. So then I go to a place where I can create progress. Is that a control issue you think? I don't know. For me, it's soothing. It helps me soothe my mind so I can make better decisions when I come back home. Really? Yeah. Wow, for me, it's a pure escapism. Yeah. I don't know if it soothes me. Yeah. I think it just gets me wired even more. It does. I was gonna say it gets me wired. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm thinking about it personally from my mm. standpoint and I, I tend to, I probably don't necessarily go and retreat back to that, but the, the game of business, mm. you know, making more money, you know, yeah. uh, financial gains and things like that is, I think it comes from, you know, I'm going to use the word trauma because, you know, and we're not talking about big trauma, you know, PTSD, we're talking about mm. little experiences in life or things you observe as a child. And I think we're talking about us being Asians and migrants as well is the sort of uh, deficiency growing up and not having enough, mm -hmm. you know, like I think even the dialogue that I've had from uh, parents, you know, I remember my mum used to always say, it's like, oh, we can't afford that or, mm -hmm. you know, and that, I think yeah. that innately is just ingrained in me. And I'm like, yeah. th like there's the survival mode, which is to go, mm -hmm. hey, if I don't answer this email, that client's gonna leave me. Or yeah. if I don't address this right away, game over, they're gonna hate me. Yeah, And it's so, so I'm here playing this forever, um, chasing my tail of, putting out fires, it's like whack-a-mole. Mm. And I don't, I don't know the solution other than like you said to, you know, you built these habits over a long period of time yeah. and now you have to unlearn these habits mm -hmm. or replace the habits yeah. to catch yourself, for example. You know, there's almost sort of a form of, I don't know, meditation to sort of identify that you, you're in these patterns. Yeah. I think the first step is being aware that the behaviors that have got us to where we are won't get us to where we wanna go next. It's the recognition of, and then the, mm. being able to identify what those behaviors are. So you just identified them. Mm. So what will you replace it with? I don't know. 
I haven't thought that far. <laughs> I've only identified it. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, that's the first step, right? Yeah. So for me, the same thing is that I identified that me being in the US fueled the bad habits. Mm. I had to leave. Right? You had to take the action. I had to take the action. I just mm. had to leave. Mm. I had to leave. So one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life mm. was to leave that kind. Like, again, it was, uh, dude. And then I went back to Adelaide, man. I went back to Adelaide. That's why when I talked to you, I was shocked you like Adelaide. Because most people from Sydney are like, oh, I'm so sorry from Adelaide. Oh, 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 oh poor thing. Uh, did you go to school, Vin? Uh, you know, it's just, it's, it was like, they just feel, and I went back to Adelaide. Like, that, like the, the, the contrast of America to Adelaide. Can't get any more. It was crazy. <laughs> I, when I came back the first week, I thought I made the wrong decision. I was like, oh, I've stuffed up. Yeah, the, all my agents were right. Right, but again, it's 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 recognizing and then it, it's identifying what those new behaviors need to be. Mm. Maybe the new behaviors are, I need to create more boundaries, right? I actually do, like I, there are days now that I said to, I said to Pei Wen, even on this trip, just before I came out to chat with her, I said, you know what? I, I, I realized that when we go out as a family, I can't take my phone. We just have to create a new rule in this family. Mm -hmm. That when dad goes out with the family, mom takes the phone, not dad. I just, I have to unplug. Mm. I have to unplug. And I, I'm creating small little boundaries. Like when, we, when, we're, when we're in the, the dining room and the lounge room, no one can have their phones. <laughs> we, just, we just can't, right? So it's creating new boundaries for a new era of life. Whereas I think what happens is if you don't build that self-awareness, you just keep repeating the same behaviors mm -hmm. throughout your entire life. And you go, why am I so unhappy? Well, it's because you've become a different person. You have different goals, but you're using pre-existing behaviors for a new person that wants to achieve a new goal. Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I think most people become really unhappy is because we've achieved the goals of a previous version of ourselves. You are no longer Ken, you are no longer Davy from 2019. Mm. Yeah. And this new version of you requires new behaviors, a realignment, and it requires you to change. But we're creatures of habit. So I think if we learn how to adjust the habits to different eras of our lives, that's the key skill. That's the key skill that I'm learning. Yeah. So, I mean, I, 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 you guys know this and I hope we get to do this next year all together. I hope yeah. we all get to do it, right? I, I, I do a process called recalibrate mm -hmm. with Ali and every year we go away for a week and we recalibrate to the new person that we are. So we look at all our core values and we're like, hey, so this is our process, okay? Yeah. So the first thing we do when we get there is we go, all right, uh, print out your bank statements all of it for the last, pre the previous year, credit card statements, everything. Bring full camera roll. Oh, well, let's have a look. If you're taking any pictures on your camera, bring it all along. Uh, also, if you've got a journal, way better process if you've got a journal, um, bring it along. So the first two days is pure data analysis. So we go through the bank statements. We look at which, which what do we spend that made us cringe? And to go, ah, oh, I shouldn't have bought that watch. What am I doing? <laughs> and then you're like, oh, why did I do this? Why did I do that? Uh, and then just highlight them in red recognize that bad behavior. And what did you spend that made you feel freaking awesome? So one thing that's made me feel awesome last year that I spent on was I got a wicked Airbnb, got my whole family there and friends and everything, we enjoyed it. So this year, I'm gonna repeat that behavior because that behavior after analysis served me. So instead of Airbnb this time, we changed it up. We're hiring a 41 seater um, tour bus and we're gonna tour Malaysia on a full food nice. tour with Pewin's family, right? Wow. Mm. Yeah. But then again, new behavior, if I didn't review, I wouldn't have repeated that behavior. Yep. So from the bank statement, right? Second thing we do, camera roll. What photos do you look at that make you smile, that light you up? Recognize the moments that bring you the most joy, document it, why? And then also what have been the sad moments in your journal that have made you feel crap? What led to those sad moments? What behaviors? These behaviors need to change. So after doing those data analysis like crazy, we sit for maybe 12 to 14 hours and we analyze our lives. And we go, what was good, what was bad? And then we go, so what do we want more of? And what do we want less of? And do you talk to each other about Absolutely. each other? Okay. We full share. Wow, we I feel share. so vulnerable. I was gonna like, say, I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I would yeah. feel yeah, yeah. really uncomfortable doing that, of yeah. course. And that's by design. By year one, year two, it was uncomfortable. But by year three, man, dude, we talk about it all. Yeah. We talk about all of it. So everyone's just an open book. Open book, it's safe environment. Mm, wow. We're all brothers, we don't, we're yep. not judging, yep. right? So we, we're just here to listen. We're just here to listen, right, to each other. We, we, we don't share any advice there. Our biggest rule there is there's no advice sharing. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna tell you what to do because I don't know what you should do. 
just share your thoughts. And at the end of everything, we just have a line. We go, hey, thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing. Okay, cool. Let's go back to our own reflection. And through conversation, through the art of conversational exploration, mm. you find your own answers. Mm. That's what we realize about this process. This process is not me there being a guru. Uh, no, I'm not there to tell you what to do with your life. That's why last night, anytime anybody asks me question, Vin, what should I do? Like, I don't mm. know mm. because I don't know you. I don't know the context of you, your relationship with your mom and your dad. I don't understand the complexities mm. that exist in your life. Yeah. I shouldn't be telling you what to do. Yeah. So then, okay, so you go through all of that analysis. What do you want more of, what do you want less of? Cool, next thing, what are your values? What are your values? And we, we, we have a list of 200 values. You go, which ones stand out to you? And then you go, okay, so these are your values, huh? Cool, now tell me, what actions have you taken in the last 12 months that prove that's a value? Prove it. So then you, you identify which are aspirational values and which are values you're actually living out. Mm. And there's a big difference. Yeah. Big can, difference. I can see how this works. Like yeah. you can really work out what things you're doing in your life that really don't really achieve your goals and values. Yeah. And you call yourself out. Yeah. You call yourself out. You go, yeah, so you say family, huh? Awesome. Mm. What are the, what are the, what, give me 10 immediate actions you've taken in the last 12 months that back this as a value up. You say you're generous, great. Give me 10 immediate actions that you've taken in the last 12 months that show you're generous. So then we, we ordered ourselves. We mm. literally doing what David does, wow. right? We ordered ourselves. And then at the end of that, now here's the great thing I love about this process is once you have all this information, then as I set goals for 2023, is it aligned? You said you weren't gonna do more of that. Oh, this is a misaligned goal. Mm. If I didn't go through this process, guys, I would repeat the same, same shit, different year. Whereas when I do this now, I change my actions. I'm recalibrating to the new person that I've become. And I just think in the world we live in today, we, <laughs> we don't recalibrate. So no. you, you, you go 10 years and you achieve the goals of 2015, Vin. And you go, why am I so unhappy? It's because you don't know who you currently are and you've achieved the goals of a previous version of you. This episode is produced and brought to you by Social Wave. Social Wave is a strategic content marketing agency helping businesses grow revenue using video, podcasts, and SEO. Head on over to socialwave.com.au to find out more. Now back to the show. Most people sleepwalk their way through life, I feel like. How did you, because I'm so curious, I'm like, you're so, um, like for cliche, it's like wise, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Davey and I, yeah. we've we've got our own fallacies and our own um, Me too. ignorance, right? And as <laughs> yeah, do you, yeah, but yeah. but certainly to, I don't know anyone in my life who does a life audit like that, yeah. let alone with, two, you know, Craig and Ali and 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 close Dan friends and, and Dan, and right? My family, yeah. And it's like, how yeah. did how did this all come about? Like, where did can you? Is there like a starting point or something? You can go. Because even to come up with the concept yeah. of a life audit and mm -hmm. what you just shared with us was like, I, I, that would never have even come to my head. Yeah, because seriously, when a bunch of mates go to like a beach house, <laughs> we're, just, we're just, you know, drinking or, you know, mm. doing all sorts of stuff and then having yeah. fun and like t remembering all the good memories that we had together sitting at the yeah. campfire or something like that. Mm. But whereas you're, you guys are auditing yourself yeah, and then, yeah, <laughs> it's just, it's a strange thing to do, yeah. I, I think it came as a result of living poorly my whole childhood. And I've always been told that I was not gonna amount to anything. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I believed it. I believed it for the longest time, you know? And, and I think I just, I want, I wanna live well. I, I just, I wanna be, a, I wanna be useful to my family. I want to be useful to my community. I want to be useful to the world. Mm -hmm. And and it's like, again, I said, I, I'm not very, I, I think I'm spiritual. I don't know if I am or not, but as far as I'm concerned, I think we do this once. And if we're in a simulation and you can restart and you've got 10 credits, great, mm -hmm. exciting, awesome. But as far as I'm concerned, I do this once. And if I do this once, I just want to do it as well as I can. And, and when did it start? I was doing this by myself. I did it in 2016. So did great in Australia, did really well in the speaking career in Australia. And I was at the peak of my career here. And then I, I had one realization and this realization freaked me the hell out. And the, the, the realization was that I'd never spent seven days by myself for myself my, in my entire life. And I don't know what it was about that line for me, but I went, I've never spent 
seven days for myself by myself. And it freaked me out. But I'm going to do it. Yeah. And then I said to Pei Wen at the time, I said, hey, look, I something's wrong. I don't know what it is, but I need to go away. And she goes, oh, you know, I think she thought, oh, is there another woman? What the hell's happening? <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 no. He's not, he's not another woman. And and like, my, they were so concerned for me. Pei Wen was so concerned for me. She's like, oh, something's wrong. That Lenny, my best friend, went with me to Auckland for the first day because he just went, hey man, I'm just going like- Just to supervise. Are you like, are you going to kill yourself? What are you doing, man? Because I was really in a weird place. Yeah. Because I, I'd achieved all the things that externally, you should be happy as hell, not happy at all, right? You feel empty inside. I felt right? empty inside, right? I, and this was, this was right after I bought my mom and dad a house. Mm. Bought them a house, bought them a car, did all this stuff, right? And I just went, but I thought joy lived here. Mm. One day after I'd done that, I was empty. And, and then I said, so okay, I'm in trouble. So then I went and dude, the first day Lenny was there, we did, we had fun, we were laughing. And then when Lenny left, oh man, it got real. Mm. Cause I was alone. And I'd never heard my voice before because I was so busy serving my family. I, everyone else's voice was in my head. So I, I, re I wrote myself a list of 25 questions that I asked myself that I've collected reading the books that I've read in my life so far. And it was questions about, you know, what your dreams are, what should you let go of, what's something new you've done this year that you didn't do last year. And I, and all these questions that I wrote down, and you know, this, the scariest thing is that when I answer these questions, it was the voices in my head answering them, not mine. And I, 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 I stuck paper all over the wall and ended up paying $1,500 because I damaged their wall in the Airbnb. <laughs> but then I I'd, I'd wrote the questions and I wrote the answers and I looked at the answers. And when the answers looked back at me, it was my mum and dad's words. It was the voices of like my wife. Wow. It was the demands of what I felt my community wanted me to do. And nowhere did I find my voice because I didn't know what my voice was. And the goals that I'd achieved was the goals that I'd set when I was 18. And you know what that goal was? Make a million bucks, buy mom and dad a house. How was it? There was, no, there was, there was nothing more to it. There, and it, was, it was the simple goals of a young 18 year old that I've achieved when I was 27 and then I didn't even know who I was. I didn't even know what I wanted to do. Yeah. I had no idea. I had no idea. These were just, these were goals because they were noble. There were, there were goals that if I achieve this and I bought mom in the house, now the community is not gonna think I'm a loser. Mm. They're in your face, huh? I'm not a loser. I bought my mom and dad a house, right? It was kind of like, I was like, what, but, but what about me though? Well, what do I wanna do? You know, I, I had no idea. Yeah. But it could be something like you just didn't, like you had these goals and you were set on it and you didn't think about anything else because that's like how we are yeah. wired. And then after that, because you've achieved it, you didn't really think about what's the next steps. And so you never changed like what you wanted to do. I didn't think for yeah. me. Yeah. I didn't think for me. I, I was so obsessed about thinking for others. And this is not me trying to, you know, hey, look at me, I'm Mother Teresa, right? It's not, it's not that. It's kind of, I, I genuinely just didn't know how to think for myself. Yeah. Well, this is something I think you grapple with. Yeah, I, I grapple Cause with Because Davey's a very noble person as well and very yeah. generous. Yeah. And I can see a lot of similarities between the two of you. And we talked about this in a previous podcast episode where his life calling is literally um, to serve his family. Yeah. You know? and, and I think in a lot of ways to his detriment on a personal individual level, because he's, I don't know if sacrificing or giving up are the right words, but you certainly are, um, you know, in certain ways, at least based on me externally looking at it, um, like, are you actually doing what you want to do in life? Yeah, for, for myself or is it for others? I'm still trying to work that out too. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. and I think these last couple of years, I, I think a year ago I was like, nah, I don't think this is what I want. But now I'm starting to feel like um, the experiences I share, mm. like like what happened last night and, you know, the the feeling that, I, when I talk to my brothers and the feeling that the, the love I have for my missus, like that's what I live for. Like it's that relationship I have with them. And when you do something for someone and you don't expect anything in return and you see them prosper and you see them like, you know, walk the life, a great life because you changed that for them. Mm. It just, just makes me so happy, you know? Mm. So it makes it all so worth it. Mm. So like, you know, when I work with my staff or, you know, my um, workmates and my family, like, you know, half half my family is employed working with us. <laughs> <laughs> the family business. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, and, that, and yeah, now I'm starting to feel like, wow, man, like 
we're achieving something together and like yeah. I sometimes don't want to ever let this go. And that's why I'm always trying to keep everyone together at work as well. Yeah. And that's um probably something that I might be uh not the best for everyone. But yeah, I've I've just I just enjoy that part. I'm starting to really enjoy it. And like mate, like I've worked with you for, you know, the last what how long has it been? Four or five years mm -hmm. and seeing what you created, it just makes it's so much more fun and enjoyable. Well, Davey's definitely one of those people that I can say he gets more joy out of other people's success than sometimes his own. Wow. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Because I'm, you know, I, I'd like to think of myself as quite an observant type person. You know, I sort of like, I, I think, I think I'm, I, t I take on my mum in the sense that I like, I'm a, um, I have a high sensitivity, mm. particularly on an EQ level. Like yeah. I can pick up emotions and read the room pretty quickly. Yeah. And I remember, I remember I was like, you know, starting up the business and business started to do really well. And I was like, I was like, what's, and I'm like thinking about a really transactional kind of, I was like, what the hell is in it for Davey? <laughs> like he's got, yeah. like, there's no benefit to him other than us being mates, but I've got lots of mates and I don't yeah. see these mates wow. doing the same level of devotion. And, um, and this is, you know, we actually, we were, um, you know, I'm sharing this story now because I pulled him aside on his bucks. We're on a boat in Sydney. And I said to him, I said, Hey man, I just want to put it out there. Um, and I shared this in a speech. I was like, I am not the man I am today if not for him. Mm. Yeah, this guy's, yeah. This guy's family for me. Mm. No, but like, <laughs> the funniest thing about that is when he shared that to me, I was like, dude, you're not, like I wouldn't be the way where I am if it wasn't for you. And then we're like, really, seriously? And so we both <laughs> met, like said the same thing and feel the same thing. And the next day, like I, I didn't, the next day I was too hungover the next morning. So the next day after, like I spoke to Shirley about it, mm. my missus, and I was like, you know, the weirdest thing happened. Can actually thinks that <laughs> like, I would like, he did so much, for, uh, like I did so much for him. And then me and Shirley laughed and it's like, Shirley's like, what's Ken talking about? <laughs> it's so he has no idea how much he has changed our life and wow. our business will be where we are if it wasn't for him. So anyway, I'm just wondering, like, it's got nothing to do with the point, but I'm just saying like, you don't understand how much you've done for me. Yeah. Do you know how rare it is to find brothers like that? Yeah. These are, you are brothers that yeah, you choose. Yeah, brother's the right term. Yeah. And, and like, it's like you're a brother that he chooses. Yeah. Yeah. That, and what you have is so beautiful and it's so rare. It's so rare. And I congratulations on having such a beautiful friendship. Yeah. You know, Appreciate it. friends yeah. like that, oh, mate, mm. <laughs> yeah. we, we're lucky to have a couple in a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we speak about Craig and, yeah. you know, um, Harley and these guys. It's yeah. like, it's, it's a rarity, um, you know, like, like I, I feel very blessed because like growing up, like there's always a deficiency around it. Like, no, I didn't, I don't think I necessarily got bullied, but it was like, mm. um, a lot of the, um, sort of internal struggles that I have is just around like a sense of belonging. Yeah. Like, um, this, even, even this podcast is like, you know, we talk about it as like, um, like as a, as a belonging, like a community, you know, with this sort of stuff, because like, I, like, it's not you, like what I went through is not unique. It's like, I think a lot of people go through it. It's, you yeah. know, like bullied, yeah. you know, like, yeah. Uh, family didn't, wasn't well off. Like we all have the same, you know, um, deficiencies that we're trying to make up for. And we're like trying to, f you know, feel a void basically. And I think, yeah. um, yeah, it's, it's nice to sort of, um, find later success in life and then be able to then, like fill those cups up. And yeah. I think we're all trying to like work it out a little bit. And like, like you said, like everyone's still like working it out. Like we haven't, haven't figured it out. We're still trying to do things that, you know, we think is best. And then, you know, the recalibrations, which I'm super interested in exploring because yeah. I'm like, I need to do it. Yeah. You know, cause it's slippery slope. Like I said, you either sleepwalk or you walk off a cliff basically. And before you know it, you're like, you have irreversible, you know, things that happen as a result. So. Yeah. And if you don't sacrifice, sometimes you get nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that's the balance, slope. right? Yeah, that's right. And, yeah. and, but again, just say, I, I'm so happy for you both that you, you, you have each other. Yeah. That's beautiful. It's a very yeah. beautiful bromance moment. You both <laughs> yeah. It yeah. is a bromance. That was really beautiful. That was yeah. really beautiful. I mean, how, how lucky are you both to have each other? hundred percent, man. Yeah. Like I, sometimes I sit there in the office, like upstairs and I, uh, 
like yeah sometimes i'm just like man far out like we like we we created this like you know mm. a few years ago like we had nothing you know we all just had this dream that we wanted to do and we were able to do it together and that it's yeah the together part was, yeah. is mm. what it means like it, it's not gonna be funny if i did it by myself yeah and, so, and that's the reason why we do this stuff like that's the reason mm. why it's it that and it, it's funny when you say like it um, I don't get anything out of it and it's, it's a stupid um, uh, decision made by me, but it's it's everything to me to have you around, like everyone around, mm. yeah. Not just can, but everyone around because what's the point doing all this stuff when there's no one around to even share it with? Mm. And I think, Vin, you're very similar in that sense with your family. I think I know why I'm drawn to you guys. You know, I, 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 I don't really do podcasts <laughs> I, I just do my own with Ali because I enjoy Ali's yeah. company I don't but what drew me in about you guys is because I think I think I have clarity on it now in hearing you guys talk on this podcast is because your definition of success is very similar to mine it's doing things you love with people you love that's as simple as my definition goes yeah my workshop is me doing something I love with the people I love the most. Mm. You know, at the end of my workshop, you know, I, I go up on stage with the people I love most in my life. We hold hands and we do a bow, right? This is my band. This is my crew. I love that. And I think that's what really drew me to you, you both and, and your whole crew is that you're people who are doing things they love with people they love. Yeah. And I can feel it. I can feel it. I just wasn't able to put my finger on it. I was like, what is it about these guys that I really love? I don't well, know I was what it is. Because yeah, <laughs> like, like, is, it, like, is it even real? Maybe I don't <laughs> like them. You know, maybe, maybe yeah, I don't know what is it. What, what is this? Why Waiting I, for that thing to happen. I'm like, so oh, drawn I knew it. to them. <laughs> yeah. But I'm so drawn to you. Like every now and then I'll get stuck in the chat group with you guys and we're just like, we're like little kids chatting back and forth <laughs> nonstop. I'm like, why don't we just call each other at this point? You know, it's like full blown, deep and meaningful conversations, but it's because I think, I think you, you yeah, you, we have a similar definition of success. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that is not for nothing. You say this, oh, he's doing it for nothing. You know, he's doing things you love with people you love. Mm -hmm. That's not nothing. That's everything. Yeah. That's everything. Mm -hmm. People who do things together just for financial means, uh, do they ever last? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I know. And we traded stories, which we don't have to get into, but yeah. certainly we've seen- yeah. The other side. And that's like, right. You know, I've even seen it with my parents, you know, they had a fallout with their best friends in business and it was just out yeah. of greed. It was nothing else, right? Yeah. And I and I think like when we talk about it, we're like, um, money money never got in the way of our um, you know, like brotherhood basically. Yeah. Mm. Um so I think that's why like that's why it's worked out the way it's worked out in a lot of ways as well. Mm. Um but I wanted to ask also, it's like you you ch achieved like on a on a financial scale, like, you know. It's very successful now, not only just with speaking, but all the stuff that you're doing now, then what is it now? Because, you know, what are you looking to, to achieve? Cause it's like, you know, you get there and it's like, Oh, I've got the money goals and I've, I've done yeah. everything I had that I thought I'd tick off and like, what's left. I don't know. And I like that. I don't know. I, I, I say this often. What makes magic amazing? You don't know how it works. Yeah. I believe that is the same reason why life is amazing. Mm. I really do. I feel like when you know how every single trick works, what happens? Yeah, there's a quote in the world of magic where they say, a magician guards an empty treasure box because we're just guarding you from disappointment. Mm. And I think when you know exactly how your life is gonna pan out, you know exactly what every single day is gonna look like. You know exactly what every single year is gonna look like moving forward for the next 20 years. Do you know what that's called? It's called a midlife crisis. Mm. That's what it's called, right? And people feel that at 20, people feel that at 30, 40, 50. It's monotony, it's monotony. And I think the beauty in magic is the beauty in life. Not knowing what's ahead of me is the most exciting thing I have left. Whereas I, I leave room now for the unknown. I leave room for the unknown. You know, it's, 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 it's what I shared with you, you all last night. The most valuable lesson I've learned from a, the man who created Siri, he, Adam Cheya, shout out to him. I love Adam. Adam's an incredible friend and mentor. And he taught me that. He goes, Vin, look, the, the greatest lesson I've learned is life is like a book and you should have many wonderful and different chapters. And when it's time for the end of one chapter, don't be afraid to turn a new page and write something completely different. So I don't know what's ahead of me, but this current chapter I'm writing, Ken, it's, it's really for my son. 
You know, whether it's a podcast that I'm doing, whether it's, I do family vlogs. I never post them publicly. It's private. It's just for my family. But every month I do a vlog. Nice. Right? And it's a vlog of how to live, son. All this social media stuff of mine, you'll see how I work. That's cool. But Xander, this is how we live. This is how we live. This is mom and dad having an argument. This is normal. It's normal. And it's weird. I don't know why, but since having Xander, I don't know if you feel this, but I, I've never feared dying because I don't have many regrets. But after having Xander and Xander's special needs, I now fear dying because I'm scared he's gonna have to live in this world without me. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's, why, that's why I do all of these things. I do all these videos, I do all this because I'm like, this is, sure, I've got life insurance to protect me against deep financial <laughs> risk. Yeah. But to me, that is not in life insurance. Life insurance is me leaving him, me. And we live in a world now where we can. You know, so, so right now I, I teach communication skills because I want to get better at it because I want to help my son. You know, if someone asked me last night, they said, what's the proudest thing you've achieved? And to me, it's my son speaking to me in sentences now, mm. as opposed to just words. It's sentences now. And that's a massive win for me. Mm. I'm so proud. I'm so excited. You know, for many families, that's a normal thing. For me, this has been a complete game changer. It was funny you talk about life insurance. I took out a policy last week. <laughs> you know, Crazy. I was talking to Davey oh, about it. Wow. I said, hey, how much are you paying for life insurance? And wow. it was like, yeah, like you, you mentioned risk. that. Yeah. And yeah. Um, but you- yeah, like I just wanted to say, because like, I'm, I'm scared of having a kid. Very scared. Really? Very, very scared. Why? Because of what you mentioned. Uh, well, 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 you're doing it differently, but I'm scared because I don't feel like I can, um, I'm scared of, what the world is for them and how they're going to react to the world. And then I don't have, I feel like because of I've been in business for so long, um, I have so much control and I can't control how they feel. Yeah. But what you're telling me now kind of gives me some light at the end of a tunnel because like, yeah, I can, I can encourage and do whatever I can for my kid. Yeah. And I see it in my brother and the way he's um, taking, uh, like taking care of my niece. And like he lives his life for my niece now. And it's just like, you know, before he had her, he was in a very dark place mm. and he still was when, when she came. Um, but now I can see a different side of him where mm. he's like, you know, I want to make sure I bring her up in a place that she can like, you know, look after herself and she can yeah. be, find true happiness. And yeah, like hearing that, like makes me feel a bit more, like, you know, accepting of it and okay of the fear because like, you know, Mm. I can do something about it and I can try, keep trying. Cause I was so consumed, like I'm consumed with work. I'm consumed Mm. with all the relationships I have right now. Mm. I forget that like, I don't know if I can really like commit to, to looking after him or her. Yeah. Well, before you say anything, I think even what you were talking about yesterday about fear. Mm. um, Like I remember when Hudson was born or even leading up to it, I was like, I have not got my shit together. Hmm. Like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. What parent, who does have <laughs> No one knows, together? right? No one's got their shit together. Yeah. No you know, one's got their shit together. out and he was like in my hands and I was like, what do I do with this thing? Yeah. <laughs> what do I do with this thing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, dude. And he's staring back at me I and know. do I talk to him? Like, what do I do? Yeah. So I, I don't know what you have to say about that, but like, I think, you know, like you said, it's not the absence of fear. Yeah. Well, well we're never ready for anything. Mm-hmm. I think the idea that you're going to be ready to be a parent, mm. it's not real. <laughs> You'll never be ready. You'll never be ready. You just never will be ready. I don't think anyone's ever ready for anything. It's why I love the quote, you have to do things before you're ready. You just have to. There's no such thing as ready. There is no such thing as ready. So look, at, and, and no parent has a child and thinks, I got this. <laughs> no one thinks that if they're being realistic, mm. right? No one thinks that. It's, it's one of the biggest curveballs you ever receive in your life. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's, it's also one of the most rewarding things. But I, I wanna add this too, right? I think we, we also have to change the narrative with, with how we raise our kids. Because Davey, we no longer live in a world where we have to sacrifice who we are and everything that we are for our kids. Mm. And I don't think we should. Our parents may have had to do that in their generation out of desperation and survival. But I think we have to, again, teach our kids how to work, earn a living, 
we do sacrifice things for them, but we also more importantly need to teach them how to live. Mm. We're living in a new world now. The number of people last night that I caught up with that were doing things they love, they're not in a traditional career. I think people doing what they enjoy and a passion is the new norm now. Mm. And we live in a world now where it's possible, all right? I mean, look at what we're all doing. We're all doing something we enjoy. It's a different world now. So I think it's important to also teach them how to live though. Live a wholesome life. I, I don't want Xander to get to a point where he's in New York and he has to call his best friend to fly in from Melbourne to go save him right. because his father didn't teach him how to live. Mm -hmm. I want to teach him how to be wholesome. I think it's both. It's such, it, life is so complex. It's so complex, mm -hmm. you know, that, yeah, we, we yeah. I, I, it's no simple answer. It's complex, it's messy, it's all mm -hmm. over the place. Mm -hmm. There's ups and downs, yeah. yeah. Well, no, I felt really inspired when you said you, um you know, you film like a family vlog. I was yeah, like, I do, yeah. I was like, that's amazing. It's like yeah. you're documenting essentially. Well, our Asian you. parents used to do that. I'm just letting you know, like we used to do that too. Really? Well, like they film stuff and then they put it on the tape. Can you imagine the, the Asian parents? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, hey guys, what's up? Welcome to uh, <laughs> The worst part about four. it is like, I can't even, I don't uh -huh. even have any, um, to play like, it? What VCR players to even play it? Dude, you can convert it to MP4. You know this, right? I don't know how to do it. Come on, just give it to a videographer. Give it to a video. <laughs> Edward, no. can you? There's a person in the room right now that can do it. I don't know how to do it. Yeah, Stop yeah. Edwin after this. I, I don't think I have. I have them at home. Do you home. still have them? Yeah, my parents Dude, gave it to me. They're them. precious. Yeah, but yeah. I, yeah, I thought I can Actually, sell them. Actually, funny, funny story real quick. Um, Cause my mom was the same. She used to film everything. My dad did too. Right? Yeah. Yes. And um, my brother, because he's an engineer, mm. um, even at a very young age, he used to at, I think, I think it was less than five, I was four years old, yeah. knew how to put a VHS in and would tape over my mum's um, video recording. Wow. So now Dude, we've that's got- tragedy. I know, I was like, so I remember we talked about this the other day. <laughs> I'm it's sorry, not a Tony. funny story. <laughs> It's funny now because, you know, we, we're like, you know, we got the memories in our yeah. heads. It's nice to play it back, but it was just hilarious talking about it, which was you'd watch these family moments. Beautiful moments. And all of a sudden breaks out into Bob the Builder. Ah, <laughs> and then Simpsons. And then the Simpsons oh. and then a commercial and then back to some, you know, something that happened during our yeah, childhood. Uh, can you imagine your mum's like, honey, I just want to tell you the most meaningful thing. And then Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, that's the worst. Uh, yeah, we've- But look, oh, if you wow. have it, you should definitely- Yeah, yeah. You should, You should You should keep yeah, those memories yeah, for sure. I'm just letting you guys know, that is a really good business idea, by the way. Oh, I'm sure there is someone- You mean turning woman. VHS tapes into MP4s? <laughs> mm. Say no, David, we've got to say no to good. this. Yeah. <laughs> I, reckon, I reckon there's a lot of people that probably need to, I will pay big money yeah. for that stuff. But you know, one of the- Sorry, actually, I will not pay big money for that. <laughs> yeah, I'll pay little money. Yeah. <laughs> I used to work at a camera shop, it was not very high to pay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. So Validate. we can confirm it's a terrible piece yeah. of one of the One of the greatest things I've done, and I encourage all of you boys to do it and girls to do it as well, is I, I sat both my parents down with a camera and I extracted stories from them. Mm. Because I said to my mom and dad, I said, I, not to be morbid, but you're gonna die one day. <laughs> and you have incredible stories that live within you that Xander needs to hear that he can't understand right now. And I'm here to extract them out of you. And I know this is uncomfortable. I know you don't wanna do this. Don't think about me, think of Xander. And I guilted them into doing it, right? <laughs> Cause I'm like, no, 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 no. I was like, oh, it's, it's not for me, it's for Xander. They're like, Okay. <laughs> so I, you know, manipulated them into doing it. And I sat in front and they wouldn't stop after that. It was one of the very interesting ways I got my mom and dad to open up about stories that they've never shared before. And, and again, life insurance. This is my mom and dad's life insurance for my son and for future generations, mm. right? I mean, how cool is it now that one day Hudson is gonna be able to listen to a video of dad in his mid thirties, working out life, you know, the, 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 the errors that is made and all of that. That's amazing. They're gonna have a, a incredible. However, they won't hear from our parents. Mm. I don't want my mom and dad to be invisible in Xander's life. Cause at some point they're not gonna be here anymore. And I encouraged Ali as well. And Ali did this with his mom uh, just a year ago. And then six months later, she passed away. Oh. Mm. You know, and, and, and he goes, dude, the, 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 the six hours of Zoom recordings that I had with my mom, this is the most precious thing I have in my life because that's videos of them laughing together, sharing stories and going, mom, what, so what was the powerful lesson you learned there? And she said all these beautiful stories and do it with your parents. Yeah. Don't put it on VHS, <laughs> you know, and, and save it on a Dropbox file, put it away, back it up. 
these are for your children. I, I, and I got that video of mine transcribed. I got subtitles on there. I did all of that, right? So I lock it away. And I said, mom and dad, why don't we do this once every couple of years? Let, let's do it. Because now you can live forever. You know, it's, it's, I, I encourage everyone to do this. Um, sit down with your parents because it's, it's just a beautiful excuse to talk to them, mm. to get to know them more and to hear stories. Yeah. 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 Cause we only see our parents as our parents. Yeah. That's it. Right. Yeah. Uh, rather than the humans they are as well. And um, we, we did talk about this. We were like, if, if we could, and even, I don't know which parent would be comfortable with this, but even coming on the podcast. Yeah. 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 You know, that'd be amazing. Yeah. 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 So that's a, a bat signal to <laughs> the parents out there. Yeah. To the mom and dads <laughs> out there. Yeah. Well, because it's, it's, it, there's so many beautiful lessons. So many beautiful lessons that, that my parents were sharing with me and Xander that were so vulnerable and raw. Like my mom told me this story. My mom said to me when she was young, uh, grandpa, I never met him. Uh, he passed away when my mom was mm. like 15 years old. But she said, grandpa was an incredible leader in that. We had a well in our family in Vietnam and grandpa, instead of selling the water, he gave the water for free. And grandpa was a really loved leader in the community. And my mom said there was this one night where she was out in town, you know, selling vegetables and things like that. And she goes, it was past, she missed the last bus home. And at nighttime, it was notorious for having, you know, really sleazy men and it was very dangerous. And my mom was so scared because everyone else has gone home. She was by herself and, and mom was, was, you know, again, just like super young, vulnerable. And then this car pulls up and says, oh, hey, your, your lungs, daughter, get in the car, we'll take you home. Get in the car, what are you still doing out here? Took my mom home safe, right? And there was a bunch of sleazy men, mom said so it was so scary. And my mom said, grandfather's good doings saved me that night. His contribution to the world and the community saved me that night. Hmm. And she said, son, that's why you have to do good in this life. Hmm. Because the good that you do now in life, one day will save your son and you won't even know. And, and, and it was a powerful lesson in contribution and the power of contribution, how it, it goes beyond you. You know, what you're all doing now, you don't even know the lives you're touching and the lives you're changing. You boys have no idea. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. <laughs> but you're creating these ripples that Hudson's gonna benefit from. Your future kids, your future kids will benefit from. And I was like, wow, mom, you had that in you? Imagine I didn't extract that. Now that was, to me, was a beautiful gift. It was, I was like, wow, that is such a powerful lesson. You know, and, and, and that's why I, I go, wow, selfishly, all this thing that I'm doing right now, maybe Xander gets the benefit from that. Mm. You know, when people see him, they're like, oh, you're Vince, boy, of course, you know. So uh, yeah, he's just creating a better world for the world my son's gonna exist in. Because, because man, I tell you what, like being a kid is rough. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it's just, oh, wow. Yeah, it is rough. And I mean, the other thing that I thought about was you know, you growing up being bullied, changing school so much, you could have easily gone off the rails. Yeah, I've got friends that are, that are in jail. Yeah. yeah. So did you have, like, what was it? Like mentors, support? Uh, how did you sort of? Yeah, for me, it was my oldest brother. Mm. Like, you know, he mm. was the one, mm. the yeah. knight in shining armor, like, you know, talking to me through things and leading me the right way. And yeah, man, I think I would have been the guy yeah. Probably in jail because we, we definitely like grew up in the you know the equivalent of the northern suburbs of Adelaide, you know, with southwestern mm. Sydney, where wow, you know, your bank sounds, your cabaret matters, you know, yeah. um, yeah, it was rough. Like, you'd walk home from school and you'd always have to walk together, otherwise, yeah. you, you know, you avoid the alleyways so you don't get rolled and things like that. Like, how did you yeah. stay on the, the straight and narrow, mum and dad, and meeting great people along the way? Yeah. That father I told you about pulled me out of the school, put me in a better school. Mm moving schools multiple times. So I would always make friends with the wrong kids because I wanted to be cool. I prioritized cool over wholesomeness, right? Mm. So then I, and, and, but before I had the chance to get close to the bad kids, I was pulled out, I was pulled yeah. out, I was pulled out, I was pulled out. So to me, I, I was just always taken out of bad environments. Mm. I think I just got lucky, brother. I just got lucky. Mm. I also got an incredible uncle, his name's Car, and Car at the age of 16 would be giving me books like how to win friends and influence people, the richest wow. man in Babylon. Never read any of them, <laughs> right? But he would talk to me about the lessons. He'd be like, do you read it? I'm like, yeah, 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 I've read it. He goes, so let's talk about chapter seven. Yeah, let's talk about chapter wow, three. He's very wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was, so my dad has seven brothers. 
and a sister in Vietnam as well. Yep. And they all worked super hard so that he could get through university mm. and he was a pharmacist. Mm. So he did pharmacy, a four year degree in eight years. He repeated every year, wow. right? Cause he didn't know English. I'm like, but how the hell did you even pass? That's crazy. <laughs> so he's incredibly smart. And then he created his, he started his first pharmacy. The brothers all helped him. And then he turned around, helped the brothers invest in property. So these were brothers that all worked together. He goes, yeah. hey, I'm not gonna advance forward without you. I wouldn't be here without you. So he came back, taught the brothers how to invest in property, helped all the brothers create wealth. Wow. He changed off. And not only that, he became a father to all of us nephews and nieces. So he'd come around with these books because he was the only educated one. He was the one that got me. I remember cassette tapes of Zig Ziglar mm. and say, so just, just put this in instead of, you know, listening to <laughs> like all these other music you listen to, just li listen to this as well. And I was like, who the hell is this? <laughs> who the hell is this uh, Texan guy? Yeah, I was like, what the frick is this? But, but I put it on and I was listening to these people and it was, I was like, wow, there's a different way of life. Mm. And, and I, I actually quit friendship groups. I quit a lot of friendship groups, yeah. Because Sorry. I knew it was a bad influence. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and and that's the reason why we create this this podcast. Because mm. like, there's people out there that don't have that, you know, mentor in life. Yeah. And like for me, like mm. I was lucky, and yeah. I, a lot of people will ask me that same question. It's like, wh why are you so different? Like, how do you see? You how know, did you turn out the yeah. way you were, right? Mm. Yeah. And it's because I had people to support me. And Sometimes it is circumstantial like, and just the luck of the draw. Mm. Right. I think in a lot of ways, it's just the way life events panned out, yeah. you yeah. know, like butterfly effect. Yeah. And I was born with a toolkit. Mm. Some people don't have the toolkit. Mm. Some people do. Mm. Everyone's got a different toolkit. And you know, what's really interesting though. Last night I talked to a lot of people in the early twenties. Mm. I felt like they are so much smarter than I was when I was in my early twenties. I feel and, that way too. And I was asking, I was like, how have you developed this operating system that I feel like we're on par. You're 21 and holding a deep and meaningful conversation with me and you're 21. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. What the frick? Yeah. And I asked them why, and a lot of them couldn't explain it. And I think I know why now, because of podcasts that exist with incredible teachers from all over the world that you with a click of a button can listen to a university lecturer teaching you about philosophy. You can listen to a podcast between two incredible human beings talking and battling out ideas. And all of them are doing operating system updates on a daily basis. Mm. Whereas you think about when we were 21, yep. what the hell were we doing? <laughs> there was no podcast to listen to. Playing there was Gundam. No, yeah, <laughs> playing Gundam. Yeah, oh, I had so many dark memories with <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. anyway. Um, but yeah, I was playing World of Warcraft. Mm. I wasn't updating my operating system. I was downgrading my <laughs> operating system. <laughs> Right, so that's why I, 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 this is where we're gonna say, I'm really old now, but I'm so inspired by the younger generation. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna do things we wish we could have done. But I was slightly, I was slightly envious. I was like, how, how are you talking to me like this? What the frick? Yeah. This is incredible. So I'm, I'm so happy to see that. Mm. Yeah. I'm so happy to see that because of technology now, because of, you know, you all creating things like it's just this. access, isn't it's it? It's access. Yeah. It's access to conversations, lessons. And to me, I look at it as operating system. So every time I do the recalibrate process, like we, we use language where we're like, hey guys, we're coming together for seven days. We're updating the operating system. Mm. We're operating the operating system so that we can execute new software mm. to live better lives. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's important to say that like, it's we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Oh yeah. And, and, and it's like people like yourself that <laughs> like are willing to give that type of information that really helps out the younger generation. Very true. As well. Very so true. it's not just us, it's it's definitely you guys as well. Um, and I, you're not that old, I know. Uh, <laughs> I get, but like, you know, the, the wealth of information you have mm. and the- And to be willing to share yeah. it. Um, yeah, like again, you know, we're mid thirties and we're not that far off your age. And God, I was a drop kicker at 21, <laughs> you know, like I Dude. was not, I was downgrading too. For yeah, sure. I was deep into World of Warcraft. <laughs> you were I was, raiding, a, like, I was a level 60 warrior. <laughs> I had three accounts, a level 60 warrior, a level 60 rogue and a level 60 hunter. Whoa. Do you know the thousands of hours, hours that yeah. requires? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't yeah, like, please understand I the do. commitment. <laughs> yeah, that, that like I was next level down. I was Windows 95 at 21. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was Windows 95, dude. <laughs> yeah. But do you know what's an important lesson out of that? Is you can still fuck things up and not do much in your 20s 
and still turn out all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and still turn out all right. Still turn out right. Yeah, it's. Ne- I don't yeah. think it's ever too late. To be honest, mm. I don't think it is. Not in the world we live in today. Again, mm. just to acknowledge that we live in a very different world now. I'm actually very excited mm. uh, yeah, for the next ten to five years. Like again, I couldn't. I didn't know I was going to be doing this. Yeah. You asked me five years ago and said that. Oh, Vin, you have all these people online from all over the world who follow you and do all of this. Oh, well, what man? Nah, come on, man. <laughs> I've got ten thousand followers, right? No way. And you tell me Dwayne Johnson's going to follow me? <laughs> Just quick update on that, right? Still hasn't replied. <laughs> Just so you know, I left him a bunch of DMs and I was like, Dwayne, wow, this is amazing. So good to have you follow me. Loved you in this movie, loved you in that movie. I was like, oh no, I've done the wrong thing. And then, so I wrote back, oh my God, I've done the wrong thing. I'm so sorry. You probably get this all the time. And then I voiced all of them. I was like, oh no, I've done the wrong thing again. I've, I've, I've made a big deal out of the wrong thing. And then, ah, oh, dude, he's never going to talk to me. Well, we had the but Chris he Pratt. follows me. He's, he didn't unfollow you. I, I check every day, religiously. <laughs> yeah, I check every day I go on. I'm like, is The Rock still following me? So The Rock, if you see this, why haven't you answered my DMs, brother? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really like you. But you did say Chris Pratt, you got seen. Yeah, he's seen my, yeah. Yeah, The Rock didn't even look at my comments. <laughs> Whereas Chris Pratt, yeah, I wrote a bunch of stuff and I left him a voice message and it said, seen. Mm. Nothing. So you've lost a chance there, but you're-, you're No, but he still follows me. <laughs> so he didn't so unfollow you either. No, they, they both still follow me. So it's, it's, and it's okay because I understand that like I, I've got like a million followers and I get like 150, 200 DMs a day. Yeah. The Rock has 370 million. Yeah. So by the time I post the DM, can you imagine? You're bloop, buried. Gone. I'm buried straight away. <laughs> yeah. so, so I totally understand. Yeah, still hurt by it. I'll tell you what you do. You tell all your followers to uh, mention no, no, why no, haven't no, 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 no. <laughs> you? know, I, I, I realize how to get to these people and it's it's find a way in which you can add value. Yes. And then add the value. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and just add the value. So I'm still trying to understand how I can add value to him. I don't know why he followed me. And so to me, I'm still trying to read it and I'll find the situation, how I can add value. Mm. It's like, again, another weird story. A, 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 a Bollywood star, Rithik Roshan reached out. I didn't even know who Rithik Roshan was, to be honest. I felt really bad. Mm. And then, yeah, now now we're potentially going to India and running a workshop for him and his community. That's insane. In and he's like, he's the equivalent of Tom Cruise in India. <laughs> Jesus. And then I just didn't know who he was. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Why are these people following me? This is outrageous. Yeah, man. The, yeah. This generation, I'm just so excited as well, man. Just mm. like, and I tell it, all my mates, like it's it's so easy to do your own thing now. Yeah, Back then it was just so hard because mm. you had a career, you had a mortgage, you still have those right now, but it's so easy to start something new and it doesn't cost you that the much. The middleman's gone as well. There's no gatekeepers. Yeah. That's right. There's no gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who's gatekeeping this podcast? Mm. No one. Yeah. Yeah, no one. It's amazing. Yeah. It, it's so incredible now. It's so freeing and exciting. And and I'm just excited for, for what you're all building here too. Mm. You know, thank you for having me on. Well, thank because, you for supporting. Because yeah. far out, I've been wanting to be on this for a while. So really? Yeah. I was oh. like, why haven't they invited me? It's like <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. it's really weird. Like, you know, they, I, th- I thought they liked me. They came to my workshop and they never asked me. Well, we had to provide value first. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah, that's I was right. like, oh, are they, are they playing hard to get, you know, and make me want it more? Hey, no, we learned it from you. you. You told us to provide value. We wanted to provide yeah. value before we asked. Yeah. That's it. And I, and I think, look, uh, we appreciate you, um, and I think I think it's a good way to wrap. I guess you yeah. know, ended up on a high instead of like bawling our eyes out. Yeah. Three of us. <laughs> we each cried, literally. We did. We each cried. And can I say, Davey amazing. has cried. Yeah, okay, I've always okay. cried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't. So yeah, yeah. this is the first. Wow. For me. It's um, the first time I've seen wow. you cry, man. No, I'm look. I'm pretty. I'm pretty yeah. guarded as a, uh, you know, from my emotional standpoint. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I think testament to Vin for bringing this out as well. Yeah, the master of this stuff. So no, um, you were going to cry on the, the box, but then some bloody <laughs> guy came in and ruined the moment oh. for us. <laughs> bloody Jamie. We had a, we had a romantic <laughs> moment on the back of the oh, no. back of the boat. And uh, and then he came along and was like, hey guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, all right, moment's over. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> no, but Vin, thank you, thank you for coming on. Um, hey, my pleasure. Dude, this is, um, so inspiring and like, you know, you're an inspiration to, um, you know, not just me and Davey, but I think everyone here as well. So, you know, and I, and I think it's one thing to be, um, you know, less famous, right? Well-known. And, um, you know, I think you felt that in the room yesterday, the, the line out the door, just here to obviously um, get you. a piece of in basically, right? Yeah. Um, but I think what's, what's more impressive, not that I need to be impressionable to you, but um, certainly the humility, the humbleness, the generosity, um, all that stuff as well, man. And and I think that's 
why you know we connect so well because mm. we're not looking at it from a status standpoint we're looking at it from uh genuinely do we want to get to know each other as human beings and um yeah no thank you thank you for thank coming you. on no my pleasure and and thank you for creating a platform to to really shine the light on uh, amazing people doing amazing things and congratulations on what you've both built i've toured the building this is sick <laughs> This is so sick. Yeah. You know how I say I believe reality is negotiable? Yeah. This is you negotiating an incredibly amazing reality for yourselves. You've, you've, you've all done this. You did it. Hmm. I hope you feel incredibly proud. Yeah. But the sky's the limit, mate. We can keep going. But yeah. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm really excited. excited to see where everything so goes excited. as well. Yeah. So, hey, congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. And, you know, if, if we were to end on one thought, I think you just- just for those of you who listen to this, don't think that you're not capable. It's often not, so many conversations last night was, Vin, I'm not, I'm not good enough. Mm. Vin, Vin, I don't, I, I'm not good enough. I, I don't think I can do this. I, 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 and, I, and I just want to say one thing to, to, to share with everyone who listens to the podcast. And it's that it's rarely that you are not capable. It's just that you don't know how. Mm. That's it. How did Vin become a magician? I read 50 books on how to become a magician and how to build a professional magic career. It's not that I wasn't capable, I just didn't know how. How did I become a keynote speaker? Read 20 books on how to become a keynote speaker. Learned the game, learned how to play, learned how, then I did it. So again, don't, don't think and default to I'm not capable. Every time you feel that, just remember and voice to yourself in your head, I just don't know how. There's a book that's written on the how and it costs you $14.95. From Amazon. From Amazon. <laughs> and if you buy bulk and you buy at the right time, you get it on discount. <laughs> so I, I wanna encourage the younger generation to, to read more. Mm. It's why Ali and I created the podcast, The Vin and Ali Show, right? Mm. Which is just, it's a podcast of two friends talking about books that they love reading. Mm. Two of the most uneducated dudes talking about books that they love. Keep updating the operating system. Every time you sit and you read a book, you update the operating system. Every time you update the operating system, this CPU becomes capable of more. Otherwise, I've met people who are in their 60s that have not updated the operating system since they were 30. Just because someone is old does not mean they're wise, does not mean they're knowledgeable, mm. right? Just because you're young does not mean you're not knowledgeable, does not mean you're not capable, but you've got to do the work, you've got to read, you've got to learn. That's why a big shout out to the, the team at I Can Study, Michael and, and Justin. Absolutely. They teach people how to learn. I think that is the most incredible skill set. Start with reading. Don't stop. Keep going. 10 pages a day. A year is 3,650 pages. That is 10 books easy. That's 10 pages a day. And you update your operating system 10 times. Don't stop learning. It's incredible. Thank you, Vin. Appreciate Pleasure. it. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Level Asian podcast. Make sure you subscribe and leave us a five-star review if you enjoyed the episode. And why not share it with friends and family who might enjoy it too? Also, make sure you head over to levelasianpodcast.com to join our email list and to receive the latest updates and get notified when the next episode drops. If you know a great guest we should feature, email us at contact at levelasianpodcast.com or DM us on our socials in the show notes. Catch you on the next episode.